coming on the air with the breaking news that the defense has arrested now in the Alec Murdoch trial. We've got details on that incredibly high profile case coming up in just a minute. We're also getting some shocking video out of Oklahoma after a tornado ripped through a town. But the whole country dealing with this dangerous weather whiplash. Millions of people under severe winter weather alerts with a new storm slamming California. We'll take you live out west. Plus, the White House says, hey, pump the brakes on this new report that talks about China and where the COVID pandemic came from originally. We've got the political fallout and what this leak theory means for the very tense relationship with Beijing. Plus, it's time to play ball, but the game is going to look different. We're taking a look at baseball's new rules, all of them, and why they're causing so much controversy just four days into spring training. Plus, in tonight's original, how one of the country's oldest historically black colleges is taking students back in time and into the metaverse to teach black history. And in tonight's backstory, a doctor reporting on a potential solution for the nationwide shortage of therapists and psychiatrists. And you know what the solve may be? Artificial intelligence. We'll talk about what happened when he spoke with a mental health chat bot a little bit later on in the show. Don't miss that. Hey, I'm Hallie, and I'm willing to bet that right now you are in or you know somebody who's about to be in some terrible weather tonight with huge storms ripping through some spots down south. Look at it. All right, this is what some people have to go home to. This is all that's left in one part south of Oklahoma City. You can see the cars like flipped over. The house is gone. A tornado went through town there with at least five more reported tornadoes in other places today. Look at this one. You can see that twister coming through Champaign, Illinois. It's going fast, 50 miles an hour, according to the National Weather Service. No word on what kind of damage it left behind yet. 42 million people are under winter weather alerts from Wisconsin to Maine. That means rain, snow, wind, ice tonight into tomorrow. And check this out in Michigan. Trees and power lines are already down. And keep in mind, this is a state that hasn't even recovered from last week's storm. About 200,000 people still do not have power from those storms almost seven days ago now. Out west, you've got another monster coming for California where folks are still digging out after rare record snow in spots that don't usually get it. Does this look like a lovely um, ski trail to you, Fresh Pow? No, that's actually a road. That are, those are literally cars on a road covered in snow in Southern California. Uh, parts of people who live in those parts of those places say they, they just like don't see this. They can't remember this happening before. We've got Bill Karen standing by with the forecast, but I want to get to Maura Barrett in L.A. We'll get to what's happening in Southern California in a second, Maura. But let's talk about these tornadoes overnight into today, how people are cleaning up. There's so many houses, as we've seen, that have been ripped to shreds. Houses completely flattened, businesses, schools all affected. More images like that that you showed with those cars flipped over just all across uh, Oklahoma and Texas as we've seen those reported nearly a dozen tornadoes uh, in the last 24 hours across the Midwest and some of the South. And so officials have warned people to stay away from downed power lines. Uh, roadways are still closed as recovery efforts begin. And officials say that they're still working their way through the community, uh, especially in Norman, Oklahoma, where one of those tornadoes really swept through. Uh, to make sure that they've accounted for everybody, make sure anybody with injuries have gone to the hospital, at least a dozen people in the hospital, though no life-threatening injuries as far as we know right now, and they're looking to see if anyone needs any overnight shelter. But this is obviously going to be quite the undertaking when it comes to recovery, and all this is going on as a tornado warning remains in effect for parts of uh, Indiana, excuse me, and Ohio through this evening, Hallie. What about where you are in California more? I mean, listen, I, it looks like raindrops are falling around your head, unless it's a trick of lighting. I know that people there barely see rain, much less snow. The flooding's been real. Folks are getting ready for what's next. Yeah, the rain has started to fall again. We have had a brief break here from Sunday afternoon into this morning uh, with the rain in Southern California, but it's projected to last for the next several days. Yet again, after that last storm, people were just starting to dry off, digging out uh, in the eastern part of, of L.A., out into the mountains. And, you know, as someone who is very well versed in snow, growing up in the Northeast, being in Chicago, the scene that we saw this weekend was just absolutely absurd, seeing the fact that there's palm trees as you're walking around downtown L.A., but then there's snow-capped mountains with in the same view. Highways uh, east of L.A. in the San Bernardino Mountains completely shut down because of the record-breaking snow that the San Bernardino Mountains and Big Bear, those pictures you're seeing there now, uh, saw this weekend. They've never seen it before. The same thing up north in Northern California. And the thing is, is they're expected to see even more snow. The Sierra Nevada is uh, expecting three to seven more feet. Uh, blizzard warnings in effect up by Tahoe. And you might think it's great skiing, but the problem is, is you can't get there. The plows aren't used to it. They were working 
12 to 14 hour shifts overnight over the weekend to try to clear the roads. There's no salt. And so it's really something that people uh, aren't used to driving in. And it's the same situation with the flooding here in L.A. Riverbeds are eroding, people hydroplaning on the highways. And so officials really warning mm -hmm. people to be careful and only go out in case of emergency, Hallie. Laura Barrett, thank you for that breakdown. I want to get to meteorologist Bill Karens, who's got the path. And this one, Bill, qualified as a derecho, right? Talk yes. about why that piece of it is a big deal. Yeah, derechos, you know, we get a couple of them every year. They're, they're big wind events. They're the wind events that will last about 70 to 80 miles and will get wind damage all along that path. Happens a lot in the summer. Very rare to get them in February, so in the winter months. That's what was very rare about that. So that was with the thunderstorms that were in Oklahoma yesterday, the ones that produced the tornado around Norman. We've had tornado warnings. Columbus, Ohio was under a tornado warning about a half hour, hour ago. Those storms have since moved out. Another line of storms coming through. We've had four reports of tornadoes today. Nothing that has been extremely devastating. We do have new tornado watch that's extended here into areas of West Virginia and the southern southeast quadrant here of Ohio until 7 o'clock this evening. So that includes Cambridge and Parkersburg down to Huntington. So we'll watch that again. Four tornadoes so far, maybe an isolated one or two left. Then we transition this into a winter event tonight. We're still looking for the first significant snow for New York City this winter. It doesn't look like a huge event. I think the roads will be fine. But in the park, on the grass and on the snowboard, two to four inches is possible. More traveling through New England and New York State is where you'll have more four to six and plowable. A lot of school delays also in these areas tomorrow, Hallie. There's also an early alert issued for later in the week, right? And we're already yeah. looking ahead, even though it's Monday, to what's going to happen then. <laughs> well, right. That, the storm that's going to hit the Northeast tonight is the storm that hit California the end of last week. And so we already have another new storm coming into California, the one that's already moving in, about 12 million people. Those are the blizzard warnings we were just talking about. We're going to get more snow in northern Arizona. The snow levels aren't quite as low this time. We're not going to see, like, palm trees with snow like we did last week. But it's still going to be pretty cold. The mountains outside of L.A. are going to get more snow. It's already snowing really hard at Interstate 80. I'm sure that's probably closed. And we're going to see feet of snow, as we mentioned. It's been an insane season for snow. Uh, Mammoth, by the way, is already going to go, going to go over 500 inches of snow. And their record's like 600-something. So they're going to close in on that, Hallie. And, Hallie, I'll end with this. Um, my son is going to say that you're his favorite anchor of all time because you used the word pow. And he's a snowboarder. <laughs> and so I am very, very impressed. Pow I, is short I... for powder. It is. Fresh pow, meaning fresh powder. Fresh it is pow, something pow, that I yes. bet your son probably says to his friends. Uh, All often. the time. Thank you. Uh, Bill Cairns, appreciate <laughs> you. Thank you. Let's talk All about right. some breaking news we've got coming into us here. Because Alec Murdoch's defense team is resting its case literally in just the last couple of minutes here. And it's coming as there is a new twist in this very high-profile South Carolina double murder trial. The jury may get to see the crime, clean, crime scene, rather, right up close. They're going to see it for themselves. And that's probably going to be the last big moment in this trial. But before it happens, Murdoch's team is bringing in the Murdoch's lawyers, excuse me, Murdoch's brother. He's a disbarred lawyer. Remember, Murdoch used to be a lawyer, no longer is. The defense is also bringing in its own expert witnesses who contradicted at certain points how law enforcement saw that crime scene. One witness kind of dismissing how the county coroner figured out the time of death for Murdoch's wife and son. Tell me what you would learn by sticking your hand under the armpit of a deceased you wouldn't learn anything. It's just not a valid method to try to make a determination of time of death. Just a guess. It's a guess, yes. So that's the defense team trying to make its case. And you can see Murdoch again getting emotional when they brought up some of the more graphic crime scene images. He has maintained that he is innocent, he says, with closing arguments expected by Wednesday. Danny Savalos has given us the legal breakdown in a sec. But let's start outside the courthouse. Ellison Barber is in Walterboro for us. So, Ellison, the defense has just rested its case. That means the prosecution is now going to get its turn for, like, the final word before closing statements and perhaps this field trip, right? Right. Yeah, so the prosecution has said they probably have about five additional witnesses to call. Initially, the timeline we heard this morning in conversations before the jury came in the courtroom, uh, you had the defense and then the state agreeing, saying they thought potentially they could be uh, in closing arguments by Wednesday. But then came up this idea of the jury taking a trip, a jury viewing, a field trip, if you will, to the murder scene, the hunting lodge that's known as Moselle. Initially, the defense brought it up, suggesting that maybe the jury 
should take a vote and say whether or not they want to go see it. The judge, the prosecution as well, said that is essentially unheard of. But the judge said he was open to considering it if either the state or the defense was making that request. Dick Harputlian, the primary defense attorney here, the lead on, on the case, he said that is what we are requesting. And it seems now that that likely will happen. The defense predicted that that process alone could take about three hours, roughly 45 minutes there, an hour on site, roughly 45 minutes back. So that could delay a little bit the timeline here uh, if that trip does in fact happen, as we think that it likely will. In terms of the details, who would be going? Will the media be able to see all of that? That has not been figured out yet. The judge just said, if you want them to have a viewing, I can work with law enforcement and make that happen. Hallie. But the prosecution didn't necessarily want that to happen, right? Yeah, they seemed a, a little hesitant. Some of the different arguments that came up back and forth was that uh, the defense said they felt like they needed to have this happen because the jury needs to get a bit of more, you know, like spatial uh, awareness in terms of how things are laid out, saying in part one of the things that has come up a lot is the feed room, the defense uh, suggesting and saying at different points that physically, given Alec Murdoch's height and weight at the time, that for him to be in that area pulling a weapon and then switching to another weapon, that that would be unlikely because of the space. They want the jury to see that. The prosecution, they protested this visit uh, or objected a a little bit to it, saying the entire area has now changed since these murders took place. There are trees that weren't there at the time. A lot of things are different, and they seem to have issue with that, saying if this visit were to happen, then okay, we need to call more witnesses back after that because we would need to explain some things. Hallie. Ellison Barber live for us watching all of it. Ellison, thank you, as you will be for the next few days. So, Danny Savalos, let me bring you in here. You know as a defense attorney that getting these kind of jury field trips approved doesn't happen all the time. There was one, people may or may not remember, back during the very high-profile O.J. Simpson trial. Like, is this going to be an if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit moment. What's the goal here for the defense? As far as I know, the last jury visit to a crime scene was the OJ case. Believe mm -hmm. me, if this were a run-of-the-mill case with a run-of-the-mill defendant, that motion would be denied. It wouldn't happen. Judges hate jury visits, jury views, because they're an administrative headache. You gotta put everybody on a big yellow school bus, make sure they're not tainted by any outside influence, and this is a high-profile case, so it's even harder, and then go all the way out, go all the way back. It's a huge problem. That's why most judges just say no. And the only reason Murdoch has a chance of getting this granted is because it's the Murdoch trial, and all eyes are on this judge. But believe me, if this was a case nobody heard, heard of, there would be no jury view, no field trip. The state says it's got, as Ellison has reported now, maybe four to five witnesses that they're going to use, sort of these reply witnesses, they call them. They think they can get them all done tomorrow. But think about how many witnesses they've presented, dozens of them, hundreds of pieces of evidence. At some point, is there a risk that so much of that, right, overwhelms the jury here from the point of the prosecution? Yes and no. The prosecution mm -hmm. has the burden of proof here, and it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So they have a lot to contend with. And for that reason, the government or the prosecutors have a strong incentive to back up a dump truck and throw in as much evidence as they can, because every piece of evidence they get in that trial is an option for them to discuss in closing. So much of that is the only purpose is so you can make closing argument about it. So uh, by cramming all of this into the record, even if it's boring at times, the prosecution knows it gives them more options at closing uh, to formulate however they want to do it, however they want to end up some, uh, doing summation to yeah. the jury. So that's, that's really why they do it. It's a risk, but they have to do it. Danny Savalos, always good to see you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Here in Washington today, the Biden administration is basically saying, let's not get ahead of ourselves about a new classified report that says with low confidence, the COVID virus may have started from a lab leak in China. That's according to what two sources with direct knowledge on this are telling NBC. If that's true, this would be the answer to one of the biggest mysteries of the COVID outbreak. How did it start? But this afternoon, late today, you've got a top White House spokesperson telling reporters, listen, they're just not in a place where they can say anything for sure. Watch. There's just no consensus across the government. The work continues, and I'm not going to get ahead of, of conclusions that haven't been uh, arrived at. Okay, so obviously no confirmation here about this conclusion, as John Kirby puts it, from the Energy Department, that the virus likely leaked accidentally from that China lab. But it's important to note here they're saying this with what they call low confidence. The Chinese government's responding to all this, basically saying, hey, stop, 
in their words, stop smearing China, stop hyping up this report. Kelly O'Donnell is joining us now. And Kelly, you know, I, I think what we can say definitively is that there is not a definitive answer here, right? Like that seems very clear. Talk about how seriously we should take this and how we should understand the idea that some of our intelligence agencies don't agree with each other on the conclusion here, that the conclusion is in question. How does that happen? Well, there are 18 intelligence agencies, and they come at this information with different expertise and different perspectives. And part of what's interesting about this is it comes, the information comes from the Department of Energy, which oversees the national lab. So they have some expertise about how labs function, the kind of work that happens there, and the intelligence that came to them, some kind of new intelligence, we don't know what that is, uh, was then put into the sort of intelligence processing uh, device Vice of how the government assesses this information. And low confidence is what they say about this. So it may not have credibility. It may be limited in information. But the fact that it is in some way related to the expertise of laboratories is interesting. In addition to that, it is our understanding that the FBI also has moderate confidence that an accidental lab leak uh, is a possibility where this is concerned. Other agencies within this uh, broad spectrum of intelligence community believe a transmission from an infected animal is a possibility. So why don't we, we know more? In part, there are many in the government who believe that the Chinese Communist Party was not more forthcoming, did not allow inspectors in, did not allow transparency of what was happening in the Wuhan lab in those early days. So they're trying to get more information. They believe, uh, the Biden administration believes finding an answer is important to better understand how to be prepared for future pandemics. And so the Biden administration has called for a full government approach to this, which included uh, bringing in the expertise of the Department of Energy and the National Lab. So that's how we got here. And can we get a better answer? That remains to be seen. Alex? That does remain to be seen. And there are real geopolitical implications here, right? Because this is coming at a time when the relationship between the U.S. and China is, you know, if not at at its lowest point, is certainly at a lower point, I think is fair to say. I mean, this is a minefield in some ways. It is a tense relationship in what is, on its best days, a very competitive and uh, delicate relationship. So here we have this issue that has been uh, bubbling unresolved for three years, and now a new information that may port, uh, point to some negligence or some culpability on the part of, uh, of the Chinese lab. And then you have the other issues like dealing with Ukraine war and so forth, uh, not before we even get to trade and all the other kinds right, of things. Right. So this adds to what is a complex situation with China, to be sure. Allie? And so I said geopolitical, also just regular political, Kelly? Like it's a regular oh, political thing too, because I mean, I'm old enough to remember when, for example, Senator Tom Cotton back in the day was saying, hey, maybe this is a lab leak. And he was getting sort of pushed aside in some way by uh, members, you know, who were previously in positions of power at the time. Like, there is a lot here to untangle. For those who have been talking about this and felt that they were ostracized and ridiculed, uh, this kind of information uh, is a little bit painful, and uh, there's some frustration about how this is being received. Kelly O'Donnell, great to hear from you. Thank you very much, Kel. Appreciate it. So listen, we are getting some brand new updates on where all that toxic waste from the train derailment in Ohio will go, including one spot in Ohio, another in Indiana. Listen to what we just heard within the last maybe 45 minutes or so. The addition of these disposal locations gets us closer to having enough capacity to finish the cleanup and to get all the waste out of East Palestine as quickly as possible. It comes as we're also learning that the head of the EPA will go back to East Palestine tomorrow with the train company started to clean up that toxic waste again, getting the go-ahead from the EPA to ship the contaminated dirt and water to those places we just told you about, four sites in all, after leaders in Texas and Michigan waved red flags over the original plan to send this toxic waste to places in their state. All of this, right, as the politics, the back and forth over the derailment continues to be a kind of hot potato. You've got some Republican-led House committees launching investigations over the way the Biden administration handled this derailment. We don't know if they're going to hold hearings. We don't know exactly what comes next. That's all still TBD. George Solis is on the ground in East Palestine, Ohio, remaining there for us on this critical story. What else do we know, George, about what we found out in the last hour or so, the new spots where this toxic waste will go, et cetera? 
Yeah, Hallie, this is really a case where the plot thickens, right? You kind of mentioned that this all kind of began over the weekend. The EPA coming out and saying, like, hey, Norfolk Southern needs to stop moving some of this hazardous material to these sites just outside of Detroit in Houston. Officials there saying, hey, wait a minute. You guys didn't let us know that this was happening. We found out through news reports. So we're blindsided by the shipment of this stuff. We're talking contaminated wastewater, contaminated soil. Right, so the EPA says, fine, we're stopping that. We need to further vet more locations where some of this material can go. They find the two sites here in Ohio, in East Liverpool and Vickery, Ohio. And we just got word, as you mentioned, from the EPA that they found additional sites, a third here in Ohio, in Grafton, Ohio, and then a fourth site in Rochdale, Indiana. And what's happening, you have incinerators that will burn some of this material that are EPA certified, and then you also have what's called a deep well injection site, which is basically pumping a lot of this wastewater into big holes in the ground, again, all under the EPA approval for sites that can actually handle this kind of material, because that is a question that a lot of officials have, like, hey, is this going to contaminate our groundwater? Is this going to pose a threat to our residents in our community? So clearly the EPA is still trying to find more sites for this material. They still can't give a, a definitive timeline when they'll have the entirety of that cleanup to, to, to do, but it's still ongoing here. This, as you mentioned, the head of the EPA is set to come back to East Palestine for the third time tomorrow, Hallie. What's he going to do, right? What do people think about that? What do people think about the way that this has become sort of a politicized issue um, playing out now for both the Biden administration, for the White House, um, for, for folks on the Hill, too? Yeah, I have to tell you, the residents here, they've said it time and time again. We're all for the attention. We like the publicity here. You had former President Trump visit. You had Pete Buttigieg visit. But the residents just want to know what the long-term solution is for some of the unanswered questions. What is this going to look like five, ten years down the road? Not long ago, I just had a conversation with a mother of two who wants more answers. Take a quick listen to what she told me. I have a 10-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. And are they going to, in 10 years, be diagnosed with cancer that's from this? Norfolk Southern is making me question whether I'm a good parent. Yeah, some really powerful sentiments, Hallie. Again, residents here just looking for long-term accountability. Hallie? George Solis live for us in East Palestine. George, thank you very much. Coming up, we have more breaking news to send to us tonight on that Dominion lawsuit against Fox News. We've got the new extraordinary acknowledgement from Fox head Rupert Murdoch. Plus, another earthquake hitting Turkey today. We'll talk about what we know about the damage and who was hurt. Plus, Elon Musk now adding his voice to the racist comment controversy from the creator of the Dilbert comic strip. We'll tell you who Musk is blaming instead. Coming up. So it's the bottom of the ninth. Two outs, bases loaded, tie game. This is the dream scenario for like any baseball player, right? When you're a kid in your backyard, this is the moment you dream about. Imagine that. Imagine you're playing a game and that happens. The ump calling the batter out because of a pitch clock violation, right? So not because of like an action that happened on the field, but because of, I guess you could say, an inaction there. That's how this spring training game between the Red Sox and the Braves ended. This is baseball in 2023, folks. Pitchers now have 15 seconds to throw, 20 seconds when there are runners on. They have 30 seconds between batters who have to be, quote unquote, alert at eight seconds. The goal of all of this is to try to speed up the game. But you saw what some of the consequences are, too. New numbers from the league, though, show that this might actually be working. Games over the first weekend of spring training are 23 minutes shorter, and scoring is going up. There are more runs being scored. Sam Brock is live for us in Miami. And Sam, the big argument here is that we're not getting less baseball. We're getting less not baseball, right? We're losing some dead time here. But my question is, like, at what cost, right? Do people feel good about an ump ending a game like that on a pitch clock violation? I don't know. Yeah, I don't think anyone feels good about what happened on Saturday, Hallie. There's no crying in baseball, and there are no ties in baseball, and there's certainly no <laughs> game-ending violations in baseball until this. I mean, the reality is, in, in the regular season, you're not going to have a tie, but there could be consequential calls that come down to whether or not a violation appeared to be uh, taking place. And the reason this is so difficult is because it's subjective. You went through it beautifully, all the details of the pitch clock. The hitters, as you mentioned, when they're in the box and it's down to eight, they have to be, quote, alert and locked in, meaning they're they're not just in their pose, but staring at the pitcher 
and ready to go. Who decides whether or not they're actually alert or not alert? The player may think they are. The umpire may think they're not. Now, as far as fans' reaction to all of this, we spoke with a few of them. Many people feel pretty positive about the idea that this is going to hmm. move things along and make the average time of these games shorter. Here's what we heard. I'm all for it. You know, it helps speed the game up. I think the attention span is, uh, you know, less than it was in decades ago. So we have to adjust somewhat in order to keep the, the fan base, you know, what it needs to be for the next, next generation. And Hallie, you hit on this a second ago. The average game in 2022 was three hours and four minutes. The year before that, it was three hours and 10 minutes. That was an all-time high. Major League Baseball would feel more comfortable if that got down to about two and a half hours. Really, it feels like that's the goal. There's a whole bunch. We just put up a graphic that showed a whole bunch of other rules, right? It's not just the pitch clock stuff. It's in the batter alert stuff. It's bases. It's pickoffs. It's shift restrictions of where fielders can stand. This is stuff that, like, I don't want to overstate it and say it could totally change the game, but it's definitely a very different vision than, like, of what baseball purists, I think, might have in mind. There's no question about it. I think offense and base stealing is definitely going to go up. We talk about these new bases, Hallie, and they are significantly bigger. When you see a picture, I was holding them today, of what the current base looks like and what 2022's version looks like, it's three or four inches bigger. You know, managers and players have called them pizza boxes, but it does make it easier for players to swipe. And also, one of the little bullets on your full screen a second ago was the idea that you only get two pickoff attempts per plate appearance. So these pitchers can't really hold the batters on the same way that they used to. Here is John Birdie. He led the major leagues in stolen bases last year for the Miami Marlins about the prospect. He is licking his chops right now at what he's going to do on the base pass this year. Here's what he told me. How much of an advantage is that? Um, you know, I just feel like there have been times that, especially with replay now, where um, you feel like you're safe and you go to replay and you're out by maybe a half inch or, you know, it's bang, bang, where now you got a little less distance to cover and, and maybe you can slide in there safely a little more often. Hallie, the minor leagues has already tested out some of these rules and, and stolen bases are up a bit. You can expect them, though, to go up likely substantially with these new rules this year. It's so interesting, especially when you look at the fact that you have some, I think, minor league teams, right, looking at robo umps like taking the sort of subjectivity <laughs> out of it altogether and putting it in the eyes of like you know a bot it feels like that's the next step hallie this was implemented for the first time in 2019 in the minor leagues this year is the first year it's going to be at all minor league triple a games so the umps do have a, some sort of clause in their contract that says they will agree to help out if it's brought to the major leagues hasn't happened yet but close to 100 percent accuracy feels wow. like it's right around the corner Sam Brock, uh, lots to watch. Thank you for being our uh, senior baseball correspondent tonight. Appreciate you. Thanks. Listen, we got some breaking news just coming into us here tonight. New documents from this billion dollar lawsuit against Fox News. They are literally, truly breaking in just the last couple of minutes here. And there's something interesting in them. They show that the company's president, right, the head of Fox News, Rupert Murdoch, acknowledged that some of his big stars, commentators specifically, endorsed lies about election fraud being pushed by former President Trump. In Murdoch's words, hosts like Sean Hannity, Janine Pirro, Lou Dobbs, and I'm quoting, endorsed those lies. He said, I would have liked us to have been stronger in denouncing it in hindsight. The lawsuit's being brought by Dominion Voting Systems, again, more than one and a half billion dollars. Danny Savalos is back with us. So, Danny, again, this is coming into us. We're working on, like, getting all the TV pretty stuff, the graphics and everything else. What's interesting here is that if Murdoch is acknowledging these lies, these election fraud lies, and he is the sort of titular head of the company, what does that mean from a legal perspective? Does that not strengthen Dominion's case here? It makes it harder for the defense here, but uh, in this motion, this filing that we just got, the reality is, is that Fox is not likely to win. That's not even that much of a legal opinion. In motions for summary judgment, you're essentially asking the court, hey, this plaintiff has zero chance of winning at trial. Not a small chance, not a uh, diminishing chance, but basically 0.0, .0 that there's no issue of fact, and the only thing left for the court to decide is that this case simply cannot win. And for that reason, these motions almost uniformly lose. So the odds are in favor of the plaintiff to survive to trial, but then the argument that Dominion makes is a compelling one, which is that Fox's definition of what neutral reporting is is not what the legal definition is. In other words, Fox claims that as long as it's newsworthy, we can pretty much say anything. And that's right. really not what the test is.
Does it matter that Murdoch, in what I've seen from this, and again, as we note, it's 200 pages. We've been on the air since it came out. I have fully disclosure, full, I have not read the full thing. But it sounds like Murdoch was trying to, at one point, draw the distinction between, like, commentators, quote unquote, and sort of more, you know, journalists or reporters who are on Fox News. Does that matter in the eyes of the law, or is that a distinction without a difference? Yes and no. Opinion is typically not actionable as defamation. So uh, if you say something that may otherwise be defamatory, if you couch it as your opinion, you may be protected. But courts recognize also you can't say something awful about somebody and then just put my opinion at the beginning of it. But in this case, <laughs> Fox is arguing that they were using protected opinion. And Dominion is arguing in return that, no, no, even opinion must not be based on false facts, on things that are not true. So that's Dominion's argument that Fox does not get the, get the case thrown out based on the defense. It doesn't mean Fox loses. It means the case goes forward to trial. But that is very significant because from a practical standpoint, defendants are never thinking about settling until after they take their shot with a motion for summary judgment. And if they lose, then they'll think about it. But why not, in their mind, take a shot at throwing the case out with a motion, even if it's not likely to win. And we have, I think, some of the, those graphics there from Murdoch and what he's saying now in this new document drop that has just come out. More coverage, of course, you can see it there. As he said, I would have liked us to be stronger in denouncing it in hindsight. Danny Savalos, thank you for your, uh, your fast analysis on this one. I know more to come. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the State Department says an Israeli person killed in the West Bank today was also an American citizen. Multiple shooters apparently reportedly drove up to the person's car, opened fire, and then drove off. Two other Israelis were killed in another shooting this weekend, which triggered a violent riot in a Palestinian town that killed one person and damaged several buildings. Number two, another earthquake, if you can believe it, has hit Turkey today. Look at this. It was, some of it was captured on camera. Some two dozen buildings collapsed. At least one person was killed. More than 100 people have been hurt. It comes three weeks after that catastrophic 7.8 magnitude earthquake devastated parts of Turkey and Syria, killing more than 48,000 people. Number three, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen showing up in Kyiv today. A surprise visit there, meeting with the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Secretary Yellen says the U.S. has provided nearly $50 billion in help for Ukraine, and she announced another multi-billion dollar aid package to try to boost the country's economy. Number four, have you heard about what Mexico's president posted on socials here? He says it looks like a mythological woodland spirit. It's called an alush. It's a creature straight out of Mayan folklore, kind of like an elf or a gnome. It doesn't seem like he was joking either. AMLO, as he's known, captioned the picture saying, quote, everything is mystical. Number five, Cocaine Bear, as I'm sure you've heard about, the movie featuring a cocaine addled bear. It's a hit. It is a monster hit at the box office. $23 million on its opening weekend, another $5 million overseas. Remember, we've talked about this before. It's based on that bonkers true story of a bear that ingested a bunch of cocaine in a forest in Georgia. All right, Elizabeth Banks doing it. When we come back, don't call it a campaign, at least not yet. We're reading the tea leaves on Ron DeSantis's latest moves, including one late today after a break. Elon Musk today walking things back a little, tweeting not too long ago that comedy should not be canceled after a lot of fallout over some racist comments made by the creator of Dilbert Comics, a guy named Scott Adams. You might know the backdrop to some of this. Adams went on a racist rant, warning white people to, in his words, get the hell away from black people. Just racist stuff. Over the weekend, Musk responded to this whole controversy. He stepped into it blaming the media and what he describes as elite colleges and high schools of being the racist ones with no evidence. Racism and hate speech is a big issue for Twitter, Musk's company. And it's only getting worse, with experts saying there's been an unprecedented rise in hate speech on the site. It's coming as the New York Times is reporting the company, Twitter, is laying off another 200 employees which could make it harder for the platform to deal with stuff like hate speech. Musk and his reps not responding to requests for comment. Emily Aketa is joining us now. And Emily, what's so interesting here is Musk kind of got into this, right? He fanned the flames of this controversy on something he himself has gotten criticism on over on his platform of Twitter, this idea of hate speech and how you, how you, um, how you contain it. 
Yeah, that's right, Hallie. Musk has previously called himself a freedom of speech absolutist, so it's really no surprise that he's weighing in on this fiery debate when it comes to the so-called cancellation of this cartoonist. He tweeted in response to the fiery debate a number of different things, calling the media racist against whites and Asians, and then later following up with this tweet, saying, I don't agree with everything Scott says, referring to Scott Adams, the cartoonist, but Dilbert is legit funny and insightful. We should stop canceling comedy. We know Hallie Musk has restored some of the previously banned accounts on the platform. And while he disagrees and denies, some research shows that uh, hate speech on the platform has increased at an unprecedented rate. For instance, the use of the N-word has tripled compared to pre-Musk. Callie, that's according to the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Let's talk a little bit more about what Adams specifically, the Dilbert creator, said specifically. He says now, like, oh, the media is taking this out of context, but he stands by them and he knows it's going to cost him. Help us understand that. Hallie, this all started last week when Scott Adams was reacting to a recent poll that found 26 percent of black respondents disagree with the statement, it's OK to be white. Now, background on that, that has been widely a phrase widely popularized by white supremacists and something considered a hate slogan, according to the anti anti-defamation league. But in his reaction, Adams, as you mentioned, has ca called black Americans, Americans as part of a hate group and said that white people should stay away from black people. Uh, in various tweets and live streams since, he continues to double down and he said that he was only suggesting Americans avoid hate. Still, we are seeing sweeping and swift reaction from hundreds of publications. Take a look at the list here. We're talking major publications, the New York Times, Washington Post, you USA Today. And Hallie, the fallout continues today. The company that syndicates Dilbert says that it has cut ties. It has severed its relationship with Adams. And we just learned his publisher portfolio will no longer be publishing his upcoming book in September, Hallie. Emily Aketa, thank you very much. Lots of fallout there to keep track of. Appreciate it. Some new NBC News reporting today shows Republican Florida Governor Ron DeSantis getting closer and closer, perhaps, to a full-on presidential campaign. He's not there yet, but it looks like he's trying to get there. You have the governor making a bunch of appearances, things that sound and look suspiciously like what a presidential candidate might do, like speeches to Republican-friendly police unions in liberal cities way out of his state, a retreat for top donors at a fancy hotel in Palm Beach, a national tour for a book that comes out tomorrow, and soon, in a couple of months here, a million-dollar event in a mid-size city. A mid-size, what? We don't know. He's even got a new video out today that is not, like, technically a campaign ad, because it's not a campaign, but it looks like a campaign ad. Watch. Florida's success has been made more difficult by the floundering federal establishment in Washington, D.C. Florida is proof positive that we, the people, are not destined for failure. Decline is a choice, success is attainable, and freedom is worth fighting for. Hmm. Okay, so if you're getting 2024 vibes from that, you are not alone. However, the governor's advisors are like, well, wait a second. It's on NBC News. DeSantis is focused on policies related to Florida, like the bill he signed today, taking away from Disney a special self-governing status over the area that makes up Disney World. That's fallout from the uh, so-called Don't Say Gay law that was passed in Florida months ago. NBC's Ali Vitale is part of the reporting team behind this one. She's been all over it. Ali, um, I guess you're... Our 2024 preliminary, one of our early correspondents on this one, when we don't even have an actual candidate, it looks like he is going to be one. He's doing something that's kind of not candidate which is he's skipping CPAC this year. NBC News just confirmed that a couple of minutes yeah. ago. What's his strategy? What's the deal here? He's got a book out tomorrow. Is this just PR to try to sell books? Is there more to this? Yeah, Hallie, you know, once a campaign reporter, forever a campaign reporter. Girl. So this makes a lot of sense here. <laughs> but look, in the case of DeSantis, right, and our reporting with John Allen and Natasha Karecki bears this out, at a certain point, if it walks like a candidate, campaigns like a candidate, raises money like a presidential candidate, it's probably a presidential candidate. Now, with DeSantis, he's trying to have it a few ways, where you're going to hear this term of Florida bl blueprints a lot. It's something that comes up a lot in his book. I actually just finished reading some excerpts 
excerpts of that. And I can share a piece of it here with you too, because what's important about this is this sort of like lays out the whole strategy of leading from Florida, but making it national. He says at one point, this is a blueprint for America's revival. We've shown it can be done. This is how DeSantis is gonna campaign for president, even if, as his advisors told me, he's not focused there yet, because he's got a legislative session in Florida that, oh, by the way, continues to lend to the blueprint. To run for president, you need money. Like, that's just a reality of the political system we find ourselves here. You have Donald Trump, yeah. who is officially a candidate for president, who raised nearly $800 million in 2020. President Biden then raised more than a billion. Let's say Donald Trump runs. I mean, like, we know Donald Trump is running. Let's say DeSantis, Ron DeSantis runs against him. Um, you got donors who are already, like, and I, you talk to them, I talk to them. They're already looking like, okay, who do yeah. we back? They're getting courted by these candidates, et cetera. What, what kind of feel does that leave? If it's Trump, DeSantis, and everybody else, Nikki Haley, for example, who else is in that everybody else camp? Yeah, I mean, everybody else is like people like Mike Pence, who I talked to on Friday, who's clearly yeah. mulling a run. It's Tim Scott, who has been teasing it by doing sort of a listening tour in states that are really important, like South Carolina, New Hampshire, Iowa. Those are important places for him. You have a constant conversation about maybe Governor Glenn Youngkin can get in. Obviously, his is a name that got a lot of attention when he was elected back in 2021 as sort of like a new face in the Republican Party. So all of this, all these are names that are in the mix. But look, for donors, they can sort of play this game and give to one person. They don't have to just give to one person. They could give to a lot of people and say, mm -hmm. like, I'm on the team, but I'm also, like, on a few teams. That's fair. Ali Vitale, lots to watch <laughs> for. Ali, thank you very much. Great reporting. Thanks. Appreciate it. Back here in Washington, the Supreme Court is getting ready to hear arguments tomorrow over Biden, President Biden's plan, I should say, to forgive student loans. This is a decision that's going to affect millions of borrowers. I guarantee somebody you know, if not you yourself. Here's the issue that the court has to decide. Does the president have himself the power to cancel hundreds of billions of dollars in student loans? Can he just do that? The Biden administration says yes. They say there is a law on the books that lets them modify federal loan provisions during times of national crises, in this case, the pandemic. But opponents say, no, no, no. This is so much money. This is more than $400 billion, and that requires approval from Congress. That's the question the court has to consider. Can the president do this on his own or not? Ali Rafa is joining us now. She, like the White House, is watching this. Give us the court primer, Ali. Prep us for tomorrow's arguments. What should we be listening for to help us read the tea leaves as to which way the court's leaning? Yeah, Hallie. Well, first of all, the two hours the court has slated to start and finish these arguments tomorrow may not be enough when you just think of how much is on these justices' plate, how much they have to review, because they're going to essentially be looking at two separate cases and asking a bunch of questions related to them. These two cases, uh, one of them by, as you mentioned, a group of six red states that are essentially challenging this, and they say that the president doesn't have the power to be able to enact such a plan. The second is from two actual students themselves who say they're entitled to uh, essentially more student debt relief uh, than uh, than they're allotted to in this plan. So these justices are going to be asking themselves things like whether these parties even have the right in the first place to sue. They have to prove uh, that these parties were financially harmed with this plan going into place. They're also going to be asking whether the Biden administration uh, was constitutionally correct in using the method that it did to enact this plan. Remember, they used something called the HEROES Act, which was this act passed post 9-11. It gives the president power to uh, delve out financial aid in times of national emergencies. The Biden administration saying the COVID-19 pandemic is such an emergency that met that standard. Uh, so these are critical questions that we're going to be looking out for tomorrow when the justices meet. These are questions that have high stakes, especially when you think of uh, what could come if the conservative majority court does rule uh, not in favor of the Biden administration's plan. What could come next after that, Allie. Allie Rafa live for us there outside the White House. A busy day, I know, for you and the team tomorrow. Thanks, Allie. Coming up, the original. And tonight we're looking at how one college is having students look back at black history using a technology from the future. Stay with us.
NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, an arrest warrant has been issued in Florida for rapper Kodak Black after he was allegedly late for a drug test and then tested positive for fentanyl. He's on bail in a drug case, not clear whether he plans to surrender. Black's attorney declining to comment to NBC News on this one. From our Midwest Bureau, Michigan Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin announcing today she will run for Senate in Michigan next year. It's the seat of fellow Democrat Debbie Stabenow. Slotkin, who used to be in the CIA, says she wants to be a part of the new generation of leaders serving a nation that she describes as living crisis to crisis. It's going to be a competitive race. There are some other uh, big names in Michigan have said or signaled they're not going to launch a bid, but we'll see how that goes. Stabenow is not running for re-election. From our Western Bureau, are you one of the thousands of people who have turned in, into this bird cam? Have you watched the bird cam? Two bald eagles taking turns on nest duty after a storm dumped like 45 inches on Big Bear Valley in California over the weekend. These little eagles have been braving the cold for more than 40 days, protecting their eggs. How incredible is that? A lot of people are watching to see how that goes when those little eggies hatch. So the original now, with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And as we get towards the end of Black History Month, we're looking at one college teaching the subject in a brand new way, Morehouse College, using virtual reality now to immerse students in key moments from the past, giving them the opportunity to learn Black history in the metaverse. NBC's Zinkley Esamwa has more. Morehouse College is taking virtual learning to a whole new level. Why teach black history through virtual reality? Why not use a textbook or the typical means of education? So immersive virtual reality is a real unique space. Dr. Messina Norris is the director of this historically black college's metaverse project. You can actually go back to that time period and recreate the scene of what happened and bring it to life for most students. Students in Atlanta, Georgia, now taking the inaugural introduction to the African diaspora course. In the class, we cover a scope from, like, say, the Underground Railroad Museum with uh, the Amistad all the way to the Civil Rights Movement with Martin Luther King's March on Washington and also his assassination in 1968. The class at times witnessing historic and humbling scenes from U.S. history. And you can see the horrendous, just inhumane conditions. It's a lot to take in. I imagine a lot of this content is pretty heavy and sobering for students. How do you walk them through that? First, you know, I, I mentally we prepare them for the class and, and say, you know, we're going to be seeing, uh, like, say, a slave ship. We're going to be seeing some gore. But if you cannot take it, you can always, you know, there's an exit button on your headset. You can exit out. And while the course requires emotional depth, practitioners and students say they're glad to dig in. I never used um, the metaverse or virtual reality before. It just made me realize I'm grateful where I'm at today and that I was born in this age to I can go back in history and just see what people went through. The course is part of a worldwide VR initiative by Victory XR, a virtual and augmented reality company founded in 2016. In partnership with Qualcomm Technologies, each Morehouse student was given an Oculus VR device and the experience is expanding. We have close to 70 colleges and universities signed up to either deploy classes in the metaverse or uh, they have uh, purchased licenses to begin exploring and figuring out what model might work for them. Professors Morris and Hamilton hope more schools will follow suit to give teachers and students the historical knowledge and technical skill to enter the 21st century workforce and world. At the end of the day, we have got to use the lessons of the past to help make sure that they don't get relived. A look at black history through the eyes of the future. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News, Atlanta, Georgia. So to come here on the show, can artificial minds help heal real ones? That's the question our next guest is looking to answer. We're talking to him for our backstory about how AI could change the world of mental health care. Maybe. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our big our bigger picture. And tonight, it's whether there's a role for AI in mental health care. Because as the New Yorker puts it, there aren't enough therapists to go around, but there are plenty of smartphones. Part of the issue is that a survey last year found six out of every 10 therapists or psychologists or psychiatrists had no new openings for new patients. 
right? Think about that. That makes it tough for people to find mental health care in the first place. So the big question now, could AI help that? Could AI be a kind of therapist? Researchers have reportedly been using data like suicide notes and audio of therapy sessions to teach the AI how to respond. So in the words of writer Drew Kular, you see him here, can artificial minds change real ones? And what do we stand to gain or lose in letting them try? Kular isn't just a writer, he's a doctor who tried one of these chatbots himself to see what it was like. Are they perfect? No, but he is joining us now to talk more about it, Drew Kular. Dr. Kular, thank you very much for being with us because this can be a jumping off point, right? Potentially for you think providers, practitioners to work with patients. It could be a jumping off point for the patients themselves to at least talk to somebody. In this piece, you walk through a whole bunch of different AI chat health bots here. What was it like using one? How did you first decide to do this? Yeah, it's a great question, and thank you for having me. So, you know, the story really came together because, um, you know, I saw that these two enormously important things were happening. One is that we have an enormous mental health crisis in the United States. So one in five Americans uh, has some form of a mental illness over the course of a year. One in 20 has a severe mental illness. And these problems have really gotten worse over the past decade um, with the rise of smartphones and our phone addictions and then the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we're really in a place where we need to think about new and creative ways to address the epidemic. The other part of this is that now chatbots have gotten so good and so powerful that they're able to communicate in ways that they never were able to before. And so many people are starting to think, can we use these types of things to help assist therapists or even deliver automated therapy to people who need help? You know, one of the things that we that I'm so glad that you're joining us for for this segment, Dr. Kular, is the idea of like pulling behind the curtain a little bit. Like we've sort of laid out the reporting, you've laid it out in the New Yorker where you're a contributing writer here. But what was it like? Give us a little bit on how the sausage was made. And by that, I mean, like, what was most surprising to you? I mean, you're 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 a practicing physician yourself. You spoke with several experts who are working in this in this field. Were you capable of being surprised? I think the answer is yes, based on the, the story. But tell me more about that. Absolutely. I mean, as a, as a physician, you know, one of the things that I really value is the ability to connect with people, that kind of human interaction that you get. And so one of the things that was really surprising is how real sometimes artificial empathy can feel. You know, I downloaded hmm. this bot called Wobot and I was texting with it. And, um, you know, this kind of suspended disbelief can take place. And you're, as a human, you're hardwired to respond to empathy and other types of cues with uh, an interaction that feels like, okay, I'm speaking to another person. And that's because I think in part, you know, so much of our interaction these days is text-based. We're always sending emails, we're sending text messages, direct messages to one another. And so when something comes at you, it's very easy to, to, to take that to be another human on the other end, even when it's not. And I think that's part of the power of these AI algorithms, but it's also part of the peril of them if they're not used appropriately. I was gonna ask, like, are there risks to this too, right? Yes, I mean, I think we cannot talk about this without thinking about the many risks that are involved. I mean, part of this is there's obviously risks involved in terms of data privacy, data um, security, uh, bias in some of these algorithms, so they may not treat everyone in the same way. And some of the beta versions that we've seen, I mean, we, we've looked at chatbots already, and they have in times gone off the rails. And so they say things mm. that are untrue. They can say things that are harmful, uh, that are hurtful. And so I think before they're deployed into clinical practice, we really need to think carefully uh, about how to set up the appropriate guardrail so that they're actually beneficial as opposed to harmful to people. You know, as a doctor, I know that a drug or a device is effective or ineffective based on uh, the trials that we have. And so I think right. before we deploy these things, we need to have the right regulatory infrastructure in place for them. Dr. Drew Kular, it's a fascinating look uh, at what AI can do and the limits of AI as well. Thank you so much for being with us to talk about it. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. It is lovely to be back with you. We're going to have more of you here tomorrow. I will see you then, same time, same place. More coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.